CCAC members have um, have anything, any comments on the agenda or request to add an item? Nope. All right. So then we will move forward with the agenda as it is written. First item or the next item is a review of the minutes from last month, from July 18th. I don't, Steve, I don't think I have those. Do you? Did those yeah. go out? Yeah, they went out, but I can go ahead and open them up. Yeah, you go, oh, sorry, you can open them, but you can't share them. So that is not all that helpful. Um, no, I, I might be able to do it. Let me try. Okay. Well, how Steve is trying to pull those up. Um, anybody else who has had a chance to review those meetings, if you have any comments, please speak up. Not seeing any. Oh, there we go. All right. All right. You guys can see the minute. Yeah, thank you. All right, so last month was our sort of partial our hybrid Zoom slash in-person. We didn't quite have quorum, so we weren't able to officially approve all the minutes. So that will be, um, that'll be something for, uh, for the next in-person meeting. And let's see. Yeah, so we had the presentation. Wait. That's you, my bad. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say, wait a minute, that was... Yeah. Let me share my screen. Ah, oh, there we go. All right. All right. Yep. So this is the one that was uh, hybrid, um, in person, and Zoom, and we had the presentation um, by Marianne on the Empower program um, and and how it is being implemented here in Gainesville. And then let's see us. Uh, Steve provided the uh, review of the climate action plan outline, and we discussed the current draft of the um, initiatives, the climate initiatives. So that was basically the current policy analysis of so yeah. where we are now document. Um, and then we had our, our staff updates. And that was, that was it. And then the suggested items for the next meeting are what we're looking at today. So um, the looking at our annual work plan, putting together a draft for the, the one that's due here soon, and then discussing um, climate summit and some other outreach efforts that are currently in the, the planning or the brainstorming planning stage. So do we have any, um, any comments on these? And this is basically just gonna be added to the pile of of meetings to approve um, when there's an in-person quorum. Any thoughts, changes, additions, subtractions? Nope. All right. Thank you, Steve. Those look good. All right, thank you. Onto the table they go. Um, so next up is the annual work plan. Uh, Steve, do you want to share that or is it still easier if I do that? I can try to do that. Okay, so it's easier. I don't mind, so if it doesn't work, I can screen share mine. So basically the whole point of this, um, 
this work plan for, I mean, I think we kind of mentioned it briefly last time, but the idea here is to highlight the accomplishments of the committee over the last year and then set goals for the upcoming year. So a lot of the goals, once Steve pulls it up, oh, there we go. All right, perfect. So here's what we put together for last year. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. It was there, Steve. <laughs> Let me try to pull it back. All right, there we go. Um, yeah, so accomplishments for last year, you can see there we had our, um, the meetings, the proposed format for the climate action plan, which the, um, which I put together based on a presentation to the joint policy board. So getting their feedback and then brought it back to the CCAC. Um, and I think we are still, I can't remember if we were allowed to vote for a workshop or not. I don't know if that was an official adoption, but it was something where we got um, positive feedback from the committee and decided to move forward in that direction. Uh, did the qualitative vulnerability analysis. Um, so basically looking at the, um, climate change impacts on specifically North Central Florida, and then what that means in terms of socioeconomic impacts to how we live, work, um, play, and move in this area. Um, drafted an outline for the, and then Amanda submitted an outline of um, waste-related issues for the Climate Action Plan. And then there was an emphasis on the need for um, intergovernmental collaboration between uh, climate action plan stakeholders. So basically we need to find a way to get the city and the county and GRU to all be able to work together to address these issues, which obviously affect all of those jurisdictions and entities. So our goals for this past year focused a lot on community engagement. Um, the first one was to identify community groups who are already working on issues related to climate change. Um, I put together a list back in the beginning of the committee, and I don't think that we've actually added to that officially. There's been some discussion of groups that are involved, but not an official um, addition to that document. So, you know, if we're doing an honest assessment, the community group connections are not goals that I think that we've actually accomplished. A lot of that though is due to the fact that we have sunshine law restrictions. And after talking with legal and trying to figure out how we as a committee can actually communicate with the community, it became clear that that was going to be quite difficult, that realistically probably the easiest way would be to have a single member of the committee be the liaison or the point of contact for a community group. So that way it's not a Sunshine Law um, issue. It's just one member of the committee interacting with the community. Um, so that could either be one person who's sort of in charge of liaison, liaising with multiple groups or one person assigned to each group. Because the other way of being able to have these conversations if we want the entire committee to be able to to interact with the community groups is that that would have to be an officially noticed meeting that adheres to the, the guidelines that are required to be in compliance with Sunshine Law. So there wasn't much of an appetite for that. So those, those goals sort of got pushed onto the back burner, unfortunately. I don't know if that's something that the newer members of the committee are going to want to take up. I think that having that interaction with these community groups is, is absolutely crucial. These are the folks who are on the ground. They know what's happening in their community. They've been working on these issues. They have really valuable insight to offer. We just need to put in the concerted effort to figure out how we can work with them and how we can have ongoing conversations. And if it's not something where it can be an ongoing conversation, then maybe it's something like this climate summit that Stephen mentioned at the last meeting where there's a you know one big get together to try to gather this information and form those relationships and then um, that might make the sort of upkeep of those relationships a bit easier once those relationships are formed and then it's just really like touching base with specific questions. But that's something that 
sort of, I think the new iteration of this committee, the new members of this committee that are going to um, really, well, I mean, at this point it's your choice, right? I'm out of here. Um, so you can choose whether you want to prioritize that or not. I still think that that my personal input to this is that it's, it's still a very important thing for the committee to do. Um, some of the other goals were um, working with staff to interpret the city and county's greenhouse gas inventory. So we did have presentations on those inventories um, where we you know, were able to ask questions and kind of dig into to the details. So I think that goal was, um, I should argue that that was, was partially met. We didn't really have a conversation about prioritizing sectors for emissions reduction, because I think that in order to really prioritize those sectors, we need to have some idea about um, what's on the table, you know, uh, politically, what is there an appetite for? Where do we have um, levers to be able to enact change to, to take those emissions reductions actions? And those conversations haven't happened yet. So that's something where really, you know, we're gonna need to have city, county and GRU staff part of that conversation to say, all right, um, from with the committee's expertise, these are the areas where we think we should have a priority, you know, is this realistic? Um, you know, and so there are some things that probably those levers are not going to be in place, but that are still really important and that those need to be worked on, but that would be more of a long-term um, push. Whereas there are hopefully some of these some sectors where we can start taking action now, but that's gonna be an intersection between both the science of where the emissions are being generated, as well as the politics of what we can realistically accomplish within say the next five years. So uh, work with staff to interpret the proposed vulnerability analysis from Jones Edmonds that has not yet been completed. So that should be completed in the fall. Steve, am I remembering that correctly? No, uh, this spring, spring of 2023. Spring of 2023, right? So that one, that one is getting pushed back, but that's, that's more of a, a result of just the amount of time that that vulnerability assessment is taking. The high consequence, high risk climate impacts to be prioritized in the climate action plan. Um, we can do that based on the sort of more qualitative vulnerabilities and impacts assessment that I put together. Um, I think though there's value in using the information from Jones Edmonds to do that as well, because they're going to be putting together a more quantitative assessment. It's going to involve um, information socioeconomic information, so demographics information that I think can be quite valuable in terms of prioritizing because we'll be able to understand not only what the impacts are, but also who is most impacted. So that one also kind of got shifted back. And then uh, remain actively informed about climate related issues and current events in our community and engage in the conversations around these events where appropriate. I think we definitely have been doing that over the past year. So, um, you know, I think that we can make the argument that we did make quite a lot of progress on our goals. I think that the community building is really where um, the committee has fallen short over the past year. And that is partly structural, the just the difficulties in operating within the constraints of Sunshine Law. Um, and partly just, you know, this needs, there needs to be the appetite on the committee to kind of do this work because this is definitely um, something where it's going to take individual initiative in terms of making those those connections so that's kind of my summary um would love to get some feedback from the members of the committee on how they think this has gone over the last year or so in terms of um work progress that we've made towards these goals versus um, work that is still to be done which of these goals we may want to carry forward to the next annual report and then thoughts on um, what new goals the committee might want to set. Um, I'm going to kind of butt out of the new goals thing because I am leaving the committee. This will be my last meeting. And I think that that is a conversation that um, the members of the committee who are going to be carrying this work forward should really, you know, the focus should be on, on your all's thoughts. So uh, let's see, I see Tom that you have your hand up. You wanna go ahead? Yeah, I just wanted to note, and especially with building the community and so forth, let's not forget that over the last two years, we were in a in and out of pandemic. And so there were some difficulties, uh, you know, 
making those networks. So, I mean, even though things were going forward, um, you know, some of those uh, things where you get cooperation and build relationships were somewhat hampered by, by that factor. Yes, thank you. That is a, that's an excellent point. Um, should have a little compassion for ourselves over the context in which we've been operating. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. There were not a lot of in-person events that would have facilitated being able to make those sorts of connections. Absolutely true. Anybody else? Any thoughts? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I, Megan, I just want to um, emphasize that when we set these goals, one of the foundations for these goals was to um, establish these relationships with other groups and, and the community so that they know what we were doing and, and get their and get their buy-in. So uh, I definitely think as we establish our new goals that uh, these community relationships and, and um, other community group relationships uh, are, is very, very much important. Thank you, John. Yeah, and I, I was just going to add to that that um, hopefully, as more in person events are safe and accessible, <laughs> um, hopefully, we can, as a committee, organize strategically around existing events, you know, public health, um, other environmental earthquakes. You know, I mean, there's all kinds of events, you know, whatnot in Gainesville. Um, but to the extent that we can piggyback on that and have representatives from the committee, you know, uh, divide and conquer <laughs> in terms of just going out and building those relationships in a more formal capacity, I think that would be fantastic. So a first step would just be, you know, as a committee, identify when the events are and who haven't we reached, where are the voices. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, th I definitely agree with that. Um, you know, and so maybe we were, I don't know if we refine the goal, just keep it the same, but um, yeah, maybe do a little more work to identify which groups who we want to uh, kind of coordinate with, meet with, um, and what those events are, and then maybe assign them out throughout the committee, the members. So I'm hearing keep the community building goal in the plan. Stephen, are you able to take notes or should I be taking notes? So, I'm taking notes. Okay. Luckily, I am recording as well, so I can read okay. it. But um, yeah, I agree. I think focusing on, on outreach this coming year and like the idea of the, the climate summit is probably the key component of this coming year because I, you know, my hope is that we start to work together on the climate action plan policies, and I don't want to do that before building that public input. So I, I think that's a maybe the theme of this year, is the, you know, the outreach and communication involved community involvement. Um, I think that is a major part of this this coming year. I think the, the two way. Spreading the word about the committee, but also that we're using those contacts as an opportunity to collect that individual feedback, you know, um, that would supplement the vulnerability analysis. You know, you could never oversample this population, the right. big population, and you can get to everybody. Um, trying to fill in gaps. And we, in our discussion, in our previous discussion, one of the other important goals of getting out in the community and also working with other groups was to inform them of, of climate change and, and how it affects them as a, as a community. Uh, so, uh, so that we are all on, kind of on the same page of why we're doing this and why the plan is 
necessary. Thank you. To the folks who are in the meeting room, we have a, a comment that it's a little difficult to hear you. I know that's definitely true on my end as well. I think it's probably because the, I think the mics are maybe not working. Um, yeah, I think we're getting mic off of the one computer instead of the owl. Okay. So um, the, the two members are going to move a little closer. Hopefully we can hear them better. And our, our guest, if he speaks at some point, we'll have him move forward or closer as well. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you for Please. saying that. Can you hear, can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear now a little better? I felt yeah. like I was yelling when I was sitting back there. So <laughs> I'm glad you said you couldn't hear me. <laughs> Is the next meeting going to be a mandatory in-person meeting? I, well, my suggestion is we need either the next one or the one after. We're going to have to have a mandatory, well, I, I hate to call it mandatory. We're going to have to have an in-person meeting so that we can actually complete the annual report and get the minutes approved so that we can submit that to the board. So we definitely need to have yeah. an meeting too. That, Even that's, if that's, this will happen the meeting, you know. That's, that's why I'm asking because I th this is uh it's it's important enough that we come together and and really lay put put things on the paper um so that would be my suggestion also steve i don't think that you can do can you do officer elections without an in-person quorum can you, you make know, that we know you're right we we need to do if we're doing officer selections which we're hoping we do next meeting it has to be in person Yep. So it sounds like we're definitely looking at an in-person meeting for September. So, so what I'll do, I don't want to jump ahead, but what I'll do is I'll send out um, the meeting date to, to all the, the members next month to make sure they're available. Obviously, Megan and Amanda, you guys won't be on the, the, the committee anymore, but for everyone else, um, Jackie, um, I'll, I'll make sure everyone is available. If there's a real challenge with that date, then let's try to find another date. Is there a constitution or was there ever, when this committee was put together, was initially created, was there, you know, any guidance laid out for it? Yes, there's a resolution and the okay. committee is required to meet quarterly. Now we we meet monthly, um, but yeah, there's a requirement to meet uh, quarterly is our commitment. Okay. So I think what Steve like the, the relevance of that is that we we meet monthly, but we meet technically in a workshop, and so right. from the per perspective of that resolution, meeting actually has a specific definition legally. Um, and our workshops are not technically meetings, they are workshops. Cor correct. During the first year of COVID, we were given an out for that, and obviously everyone was doing that. But uh, over this past year and moving forward, yes, um, we should be meeting in person at least quarterly. Um, and, and James, I can send out, in fact, I'll do that. I'll send out the resolution out again since we're going to have some new members. Um, and I will be, well, I'll, I'll, do, I'll tell you at my, my um, updates, some other aspects that we're dealing with. I don't know how this gets translated to decision or action, but I feel a really strong sense of urgency now like i feel like so much has happened and you know just the, the impact of the heat waves and droughts like it's really come to the forefront in the last year um, among the public and so i just i feel i'm feeling like tension not tension just urgency like but i'm not sure how to channel that in the most appropriate way but i imagine many of you are feeling 
but you know, I have days when I think like, we need to just focus on the adaptation because people are suffering. Uh, but we only have a few more years to really make a difference in terms of mitigation if we're going to avoid the worst impacts, as we all know. So I just wanted to throw that out there because I know we can't have a long philosophical discussion about it, but um, if anyone has ideas. But those can go into the goal for this coming year if you want to. Yeah. How do it accelerate? Yeah, I, I, I also think that the, uh, the timing is good for public interest. Mm -hmm. uh, also, funding. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a, a lot of green funding now that uh, I think uh, is, is coming about. Uh, and, and solar adaptation is, is becoming more and more uh, on, the, on the public's mind. So I, I do think the adaptation of, of measures are becoming uh, more, more easily done now. Um, I've been working with a group of, of environmental justice on NAACP. We, we have this grant that, we're, that we talked about in our last meeting where we're actually looking at uh, microgrids in the community and, and the same concept of working with the community group and identifying green jobs for youth. Uh, so there, there is a lot of groups that are now working uh, on adaptation and, and community involvement, uh, a lot more on weatherization and getting homes uh, fit so that they can be uh, used, can, they can adapt to solar. Uh, so I think now there will be a great time to kind of collective, and I think even from our uh, political environment that people are now listening a little bit more. Yeah, and I would, I just also wanted to share, I don't have definitive news yet on this, but um, the, I've been working with a group called the, what we're calling ourselves the Florida Energy Equity Coalition. Um, at the University of Florida with uh, CWC is involved with that as well, and the Office of Sustainability and FAMU, and we met with administration a couple months ago and put forth a proposal for a $6.7 million budget request to the legislature to basically elevate and amplify the extension role of energy efficiency programming and climate justice is a whole shebang. So the Inflation Reduction Act coming out, I'm hoping, and I think it's my professional role, I'm really hoping this will get funded because I think it's going to help the state a lot as extension can be at the forefront of this. Um, but stay tuned. Hopefully, I'll have good news to share soon. <laughs> So I'm hearing like this this need to again, to amplify, to accelerate, to move forward, and then Jenison and John, you're, you know, talk about grants. I mean, is that something that that the committee would want to put into the goals for next year? I mean, does the committee want to have a specific goal of perhaps identifying grant opportunities or something, some sort of language? that really speaks to the urgency and speaks to, to, to acting as a catalyst in some way to get, to get the ball rolling on, on mitigation or adaptation. I mean, I know that that's the charge of the committee, um, but there, I, I don't know if it's worth putting specific language in there about that. And then does the committee want part of its role to be identifying those grant opportunities? I don't know if the committee wants to be the ones to draft the um, applications or just really wants to kind of be a clearinghouse for brainstorming to say, hey, this is an opportunity, is this a good fit? Um, but doing that could certainly be something that the committee tasked itself with. Well, I 
Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure if our role, because we have to run everything through the county and the city uh, commissioners, whether actually getting grants is something that we, we can do. But what we can do is work with and identify groups that are doing these things and, and then match them to some of the policies that we're, we're given to accomplish. Uh, I, I think that that was, you know, that's where I think we can we can uh, accomplish some of our goals by working with some of the groups that have actually obtained these grants, and then identifying how these grants match up to some of the uh, uh, goals within the plan. Well, I, I'm going to say that the Empower Grant that you're involved with as a NAACP. Um, you know, it doesn't have funds attached to it, but it's a pretty... It's a technical grant. that It, it lays out a roadmap. Uh, and, and then with that roadmap, it's used to get funding. Uh, so, uh, you know, it, it, it actually, the first part of that is the first part that we're talking about, is getting in the community and identifying the leaders in the community and letting them know what we're doing and why it's important. So I, I think by working with the different groups that are doing this, some of the church groups that are doing this, we can we can accomplish some of our goals through working through some of these organizations. And I would love to see, like if I could have my wish list, like I would love to have a workshop. I don't know if this is even possible, but I mean like an in-person workshop with you know, Mary Ann Schenck, those who've come and presented to our committee, those who are leading these efforts already in this community, and have a, you know, sit down and vision and identify opportunities and, like, have it professionally facilitated so that we have outcomes, you know, action items as outcomes. But I would love to just have that conversation. Like, I think it's hard, you know, when we have a dedicated, but uh, small group of the public who attends these meetings regularly and provides input. But if we plan ahead, maybe it's like at the climate, if we do a climate summit in the spring, um, maybe we could do something ahead of that that a select group of the public who, who've already been doing a lot of this work. That's more of a listening session, visioning, and identifying action. I'll just more voices would be <laughs> In terms of getting that done based on what we've seen over the last couple of years, I think it'd be really helpful to have someone step up as kind of the champion for that or the the leader, the organizer to focus on the community engagement. Like we, we first started out having sort of like the science team, right? And like the communication outreach team and that that strategy you know, we kind of ended up moving away from that, but I think that having, there needs to be a champion to really be pushing this forward in an organized way and making it happen. If it's just sort of a vague thing that the committee wants to do, it tends to get, um, it, it tends to get taken up by, you know, things that come up each month, you know, or, or other items, but in order to really continue it forward, there needs to be some um, organization between meetings that really, yeah, needs a champion. So, so Megan, I can I can pull together the the kind of the goals from last year and turn it into kind of from my notes, um, some of the accomplishments. And I'll go back over the year, see if any uh, anything else came up. If we have lots of presentations from different groups, um, and I'll put those in at least as items that were, were done. Um, and then maybe at the next meeting with, with new committee members, 
the, the group can go through the, the goals from last year and, and like you, I think you suggested, kind of tweak some of them um, with maybe some focus on the outreach component that you all were talking about um, so that we can, I'll try to pull that document together that can then be tweaked and worked on at the next meeting in person. Yeah, and, and I'd just like to also mention that it's not just the community group. I think it's very important to bring together all the political groups. So one of the things that definitely came out as a success item in, in working with the empowerment program is that uh, we had representatives from GRU. I see Eric there. Uh, he's he's on, also on that committee. Uh, and we had well, several representatives from GRU, and we had representatives from the city, the county, uh, and uh, several other political organizations. And they all kind of came together and we talked about the programs that they have in place. And I think that that's very important too, to uh, bring our political group together and, and, and know what programs that they're offering. Uh, and how that fits into the, the picture. Steve, I'm hearing some ideas for the climate summit. Yeah, it sounds like maybe that's a good good way to kind of organize some of these concepts as well as kind of some pre-planning meetings. I think as Jennifer suggested, and I think that'll help to pull together a summit that will be useful for the community moving forward to it. All right, well, do we have, do we have any more conversation on the annual report? I mean, Steve, I think that your, your plan for this is good. Um, does anybody else, but actually before we leave this, does anybody else have specific accomplishments that they want to highlight that we did this past year? Nope. Okay, then yeah, Steve, I think maybe just going back through the old agenda items and picking out, you know, the presentations that were had, the discussions that were had, and then, you know, listing those out as accomplishments. Okay. And then, yeah, next meeting will be, you know, the conversation here is really focused on the need for community engagement. Um, obviously, with goals in a document like this, you don't want it to be so specific that it ties your hands or ties you down, but I think that, you um, coming up with having the conversation to know the direction that you want to go and getting into some specificity with that will allow the crafting of goals that are broad enough to allow the wriggle room, but also um, are specific enough to um, help continue to point the committee in the direction that it wants to go. All right, well, going once, going twice on annual report, Okay, so our next item are going to be our staff updates. Um, Steve, do you mind leading us off? Sure, um, I've got a few. Um, I think you noticed Betsy Riley's on the call. She was actually selected to be on the committee, but she is our county sustainability manager. She got hired. Um, so Betsy's actually going to continue to work with the committee along with myself, and we're going to Kind of work on these strategies together. Um, I'm really excited to have Betsy on board. And I think you introduced yourself last meeting, but Betsy, if you want to say anything else now, you're welcome to. Um, sure. Yeah, just that I'm excited to be working with you all. Um, my background is in, it sounds like a really good time for me to be coming on. I did community engaged scholarship for my dissertation. So Definitely happy to help um, the committee in that direction, however they'd like to move. Um, and yeah, and yeah, lo uh, looking forward to, to hearing from, thank you guys all for your work and I'm looking forward to hearing from the next group too. Thank, thank, thanks, Betsy. Um, and she's in, I think she may have mentioned, but she's in the manager's office and received 
program, which is the Sean McClendon and the Equity Officer. So um, they they have far-reaching abilities to, to get a lot of departments and, and and other agencies engaged in our efforts. So I'm I'm really happy to have Betsy on board. Welcome, Betsy. Welcome. So so with with Betsy now a county employee, there's a there's a vacancy. Uh, from Betsy's position, um, as Jackie is on here, she um, she's one of the new members along with Jensen getting renewed. Um, but Betsy, vacancy is open, and unfortunately, uh, Christine Denny and Steve Mulkey are both off the committee due to constraints on their ability to, to make the meeting. So we actually have three vacancies. Again, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to send out a press release and an advertisement um, later this week, and we're going to try to get um, the Joint Water and Climate Policy Board to select new members at their next meeting in October. So there's a second round for anyone who's interested. <laughs> if you want to come back on the committee, um, you're welcome. Uh, but that advertisement will go on out, and what I'll do is I'll send it off for you all as well, and you can spread the word and let people know there's there's going to be three vacancies. So we are, um, you know, unfortunately we're down three members again. Um, so we're currently sitting with with six members. Um, so that makes it tough for a quorum. I I'll, I'm going to go back over the rules. I think if they're officially vacant. I'm going to try to determine whether we don't have to have five. Maybe we can have four. Or, yeah, four out of six instead of five out of six. The, the other thing I want to mention, and I included this in an email today to the committee, was that the county commission has asked this board and other boards to look at the special area study that was submitted by. Um, the, the lead property out on Parker Road is a 4,000 acre parcel, and they're interested in developing the property. So, to develop a, a property that's identified in the county strategic ecosystem area, you have to do a study. And the study has to determine that you're going to protect the integrity of that system before you can do anything. So, before they can develop the property, they're required to submit uh, a study that identify what should be protected and how they're going to be protected. And once the study's been approved by the board, then they would come back with what's called a special area plan. And the plan would lay out the real detailed development strategies, you know, how they're going to hit the transportation, whether on water and sewer, um, what kind of densities they might want, whether they want commercial or just residential, whether they're going to keep agricultural uses. Currently it's zoned all Rural ag is actually outside the urban service area, which means they don't have water and sewer available. But they're obviously interested in, in getting those urban services incorporated into any future development. So um, staff is bringing um, their analysis back, and we're going to present along with the applicant on September 20th board meeting. And so if if this board is interested in hearing from the applicant. We can set that up. It's definitely not our typical thing, and but the board made a suggestion that this committee be one of the committees that looks at that special area study. Maybe there's a climate component that may be of interest, knowing that this is a higher density proposal impacting areas um, in western Rochester County. I don't want to give too many details because I don't want to influence you all in any way, but staff will be presenting and the applicant will be presenting. On September 20th, um, which is the day after I believe you all meet next month. Um, so, you got maybe this, my suggestion is you all look individually at that and, and send me questions or information you'd like to hear. If, if, if unless the board wants to make a motion, they can't make a motion, but if, um, if you're interested in getting the applicant to come to the next meeting, I can attempt to set that up. I don't think that requires a motion necessarily. If there's an interest, I could probably do that. Um, and I can give up 
more information about how the study, why the study is being done, if, if any of you are interested. I'll kind of leave it at that. Um, if any, any comments or anything? There, there is a component of a golf course associated with it. Um, and that, that's another aspect of it, which is maybe what you're about to tell me is you, you have to create separate permits. I, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I think it definitely would, would uh, be something that it's all in the range of what we're looking at. And uh, I, I would be interested. Uh, I think it, it would definitely. Is, is that a, would they have city sewer there? So currently there is no city sewer, but it, it, it abuts up to the urban service line. So potentially they would be getting sewer connection to the development if that was authorized through their special plan. And I do want to clarify that September 20th is just a workshop. No motion by the, the county commission is going to take place. A second meeting in October is going to be the earliest in which the board's going to make a decision on supporting the study. And again, at this point, it's just the study, which is focused on the, the resources on the property and what should be protected um, if anything is developed on the property. So that's the focus of the study. Any other questions? Okay. If there, there's no other comment there, um, I think that was. Those were my items. Um, I did get some action items, so I'll make sure I'll, I'll provide information back to the committee next month. Thank you, Steve. Do you want any feedback or like a an official request from the committee regarding that presentation in October? So there, there'll be a presentation in September. Yeah, that might be a way in which the, this committee could provide some input is hearing the information provided at that September 20th meeting and providing comment um, to the board prior to their October meeting. If that's something that happens, we may have to schedule a special meeting. Okay. Because, so, yeah, because of the timeline between September 20th and I think October 10th. I don't believe this board meets in between those two times. Okay. All right, thank you, Steve. Um, our next update, Tom, do you have anything for us? I wish I had a nice uh, long uh, update uh, like Stephen had, but uh, fortunately I don't have any updates from the city. I mean, if somebody has any questions, I I can I'm happy to take them. Uh, as best as I can, but uh, it's um, kind of our busiest time of the year over at the city with students coming back. So we've all been uh, a little overwhelmed lately. So, okay. The annual Gainesville cycle. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Anybody have any questions for Tom regarding the city, city and climate? Nope. Thank you. All right, great. All right, Eric. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, Eric uh, Walters has replaced Justin Smith as the liaison for GRU. So, Eric, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. Uh, so, first of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Eric Walters. Uh, I have the, the new role, the newly formed role of Interim Chief Sustainability Officer for the utility. Um, so we'll be primarily focused on strategic planning and long-term sustainability. Uh, obviously, the, the city commission goal of net zero by 2045 will be a, a large thing on my list to, to begin to tackle and, and work towards. Um, so again, I'm here as a liaison. I'm here to answer questions. Uh, feel free to reach out at any point. I, again, I am new here, so I'm getting, getting up to speed on, on objectives and, and how, how things are and, and, and what your goals are. Um, but I do appreciate, uh, especially in the past, working with John on the Empower team and, and having those discussions about community outreach and understanding that part. Um, and believe it or not, we GRU has a is is reformulating how we look at, at outreach and connecting with the community um, because the dynamics have changed. 
Um, and those are things that, are, that have to be considered when you're rolling out objectives, when you're getting that feedback to make sure you're getting a representative uh, response from the community. So I'm glad to join in on those discussions here, the things that other folks are doing and working towards that. Um, and if you guys have any questions, please let me know. Thank you, Eric. I think the, the whole committee uh, is, well, I don't know, speak for myself, I'm really excited that you're here and that you're in that role with GRU. I think that's something um, that's going to be hugely beneficial um, as the whole area of the city and the county and the, you know, the outlying communities really work to tackle climate change. So thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Anybody have any questions for Eric? He, like, maybe like softballs for his first meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would appreciate that. <laughs> I just want to echo uh, that. I, I'm glad to see uh, one, one of the, I won't say missing components, but one of the components that we know are very, is very critical for us to make uh, our climate action plan work is to have GRU at the table. And uh, I can, uh, say on our empowerment team, uh, GRU has participated very, very well, and I'm looking forward to uh, having them participate likewise with our, with our team also. Uh, Eric, you know, uh, uh, GRU has a climate action plan, and uh, I, I'm just wondering, has that been looked at and updated? Uh, any changes to that? So that's a great question. Um, and, and again, that's part of what this role is envisioned to do. Um, part of my responsibilities will have not only environmental compliance reporting to me, but also overall compliance. And that'll be one of the things as far as a long, long term plan of updating that, taking a look at see where we are, what needs to change, how do we modify that uh, to better reach that goal. And so that's one of the things that's on my list to, to get going and, and um, in review. So short answer is yes. Uh, it is is under my purview and we'll we'll be taking a look at that. Great. Any other questions? All right. All right. Thank you, Eric. Welcome. I have a question. Thank you. Eric, have you yet convinced here you to completely um, divest from fossil fuels. I expect, <laughs> that, you know, within the first month on the job, that's what. Yeah, yeah. That's, um... Jonathan doesn't go for the softball questions. <laughs> I was, I was about to say that that's not a softball. That's a fastball down the middle. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll take a swing at it. Um, and, right. and I'll tell you right now, you'll probably be disappointed with the answer. <laughs> Um, but, but the short answer is, are we looking at it? Absolutely. Um, is it a, is it a requirement for us to re reach our climate goals and our sustainability goals? Yeah. Uh, the longer answer is it's not an overnight solution. Um, and it is a not quick, not a quick thing to do. There is a transition period that has to happen there. Um, in the state of Florida, we basically have access to two renewable energy sources. They are solar and they are biomass. Well, we've got biomass and we've got solar. Um, we have also, like I said, the compliance part falls under my area too. Part of that is, is grid stability. And that's a huge part of compliance and that uh, NERC and the federal government are saying that the energy grid and energy is considered a, a resource that everyone has to have access to and reliability is a main concern. Well, solar is, um, has an impact on that. The more solar that you put on your system, the more unstable it tends, tends to get unless you can mitigate that with something. That answer may be batteries, it may be some other technology that's developing. And so can we do it today overnight? Uh, we can, it's gonna cost a lot. And anybody in the room knows that GRU already has some of the highest rates, right? But long-term planning, can we get there? Absolutely. But it is gonna be a transition and we wanna make sure we do it in a smart way um, because the more we raise our rates, we already know that there's certain portions of our, our customer base that are more affected by those than others, right? So we have to do it in a balanced way. The way we're defining sustainability is basically a three-legged stool that has to go together. Number one is environmental compliance, right? And stewardship. 
That's one part of it. Um, the second part is people. That's internal to GRU and that's external to GRU, mainly our customers in the community and community groups and interactions. The third part of that stool is cost. Um, and so that has to be a factor as well because too high a cost affects those other things as well. So um, it, it, sustainability is looking at a balanced approach to answer those questions. So short answer, can we do it overnight? No, we can't. Um, is that in the plan to be able to, to map out a plan to get there and allow some technology to develop to, to quicken that transition? Absolutely. So we're looking at those things. That was a really impressive answer to yeah. a question that I expected you to just say, no, of course not. Not yet. <laughs> not yet. But just knowing that, like hearing that, you know, I, I'm encouraged that there are more options on the table that we're, you know, able to at least think about what could be um, recognized. Yeah, there all the things. There are a lot of options coming to the table. And I say coming to because there's a lot of development and push and incentivizing industries and innovators to move and push that technology forward. The thing is, it's not ready to roll out tomorrow. And that's the, the stumbling block, right? One thing the city of Gainesville and GRU can't afford also is to be serial number one, right? We can't afford to be the R&D facility. We just don't have the funds and it affects our customers too much. But we can be a close follower when these technologies are vetted, that all the kinks are work out, worked out and they're commercially available and they work as a resource to move us toward that renewable goal and that net zero goal, then absolutely we'll take steps to try to integrate those into our system. But there's the short answer is a lot of those technologies just aren't available right now. They're in development or they just cost too much right now. When the cost comes down, when the, the commercial availability is there, absolutely, we'll take a look at that transition. I, I just want to ask if one of those options that, that, that has hopefully a, a, a lot of potential is renewable power purchase. Uh, is that something that you're, you're looking at? I'm sorry, John, did you say renewable power purchase? I yeah, you kind of broke up. purchase agreement from a renewable power from other utilities. That's a good, that's a good question. Um, and theoretically, yes, it's possible, right? Um, here's something to think about though. Um, the average renewable percentage in the state of Florida is less than 5%. Um, for GRU, we're, we're, around 20%, 20 to 22% renewable. We are well ahead of the rest of the state. The question is, where does the market come from for that renewable energy, right? Everyone else has to get those numbers up to develop that market to be able to contribute, number one, excess energy into that market, and then regulation and buying of that market as well, right? There are some steps that are going on across the industry to try and move that way or to facilitate that. Uh, one of those is the Southeastern Energy Exchange Market or SEAM. Um, and it basically encompasses all of the major utilities in the Southeast, uh, Southern Company, Duke Power, um, TVA. They're, they're forming a 15 minute market basically. And the advantage of that is right now, if I wanted to buy power, it takes about an hour and a half for me to do that and actually get it delivered. This market's goal is to do that same thing in 15 minutes. Well, what does that allow me to do? Number one, it allows me to buy excess power from others. And as solar ramps up, a lot more of that power will be solar that will be purchased to, uh, to help support our grid. And number two, as we ramp up our solar and as we, in some cases, uh, you know, continue to build more solar, there will be times of the day where there is more solar than we have load. So where do we put it? The regulatory agencies say we have to maintain balance um, so we can't just dump it. And so these short term markets give another outlet for entities to put that power into the market for someone else to be able to buy or purchase to support their load as well. So uh, I know that was a kind of a long answer, but uh, renewable energy market, there is nothing in that per se that's in development, but some of the steps that are being made um, because of the upcoming increase in solar energy and those outputs, 
lend themselves to move the market that way. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, yes, it, 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 it does. It kind of ties everything together. Um, but uh, yes, yes, there's there's some larger, larger utilities. You, you mentioned that GRU couldn't be the research part, but there are larger utilities that are doing that research. And it, it would be really nice to have GRU be able to take advantage of some of the research that they come up with. Absolutely. And that's the plan. We're following that as well. We, we've hired a few consultants. We, we uh, subscribe to publications. We're part of different market and energy groups and hearing about these pilot projects and where they are and where they are in the, in the development. And, there, and like I said, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of great work that people are doing. Um, unfortunately, it's just not ready right now to deploy on a large scale, which is where we would need it. So once it gets there, then, then we'll be ready to take advantage of it. So one of those is another. Have have you heard? I'm sure you'll be hearing more if you haven't already about virtual power plants, like market pilots of virtual power plants, where it's basically you know a distributed generation system, um, but it's integrated with your centralized system. And I know that there have been some pilots, at least a handful, one in Texas. There are companies that help set this up, you know, engineering and the whole financial, you know, the cost calculation that moves the load and distributes the power and storage. So I don't, I don't know that much about virtual power plants other than I was introduced to the concept last year by somebody. <laughs> I was like, wow, this sounds cool. And maybe it's yeah. We, we, the point is, GRU doesn't have to. Invent, re invent the wheel. It's, it's a lot of things that are out there. Uh, I, I know that uh, several utilities, larger utilities, do sort of power and light, uh, all have great research and they're doing uh, great things in terms of renewable power. And, uh, you know, that things right in our backyard. Uh, you know, we talk about the microgrids in the community and things like that. and, and uh, Tico, Cap Electric has been able to uh, to use a, a microgrid, a solar microgrid, as a demand side management me measure, and actually get uh, get rebates for it. So these are things that uh, politically and policy wise that are happening, and uh, you know it, it just you know GRU doesn't have to reinvent these things; they're they're out there and being done right now. Yeah, you're, you're right, John. There, We do follow that. I'm aware of the, the Tico microgrid concept. Um, we actually had a, a discussion today with a solar company and, and talking about, well, they work with some of those folks to create those microgrids. Well, how do we do that? What are the what are the basics of that, right? How can we integrate that if a neighborhood comes to me and says we want to become a, a, a microgrid? Well, what does that mean? Um, and so how do we integrate that? Um, and you're right, solar, I mean, uh, FPL is doing uh, great things. They're pushing the envelope and that I'm not sure if you're familiar, but they just came out with their real zero plan, um, like zero emission plan, basically. And so, you know, when you read that, those things are exciting. Um, but digging into the details, there's still a lot of unanswered questions and that, that fill in the holes. There's, there's, there's big answers to some of those questions, but then the details of tying it all together are still unknown or are still figuring those out, right? And so that's the question that everyone is trying to answer right now. So with folks like FPL who have, who have the cash and have the resources to push that forward, as they push and as they solve those, 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 those problems, Absolutely. We would be a fool not to follow right behind them and implement something like that on a smaller scale. But when those deep, they, they have to figure out some of those details, right? That's right. what we can't afford to pour money into, but they do. And as they, as they answer those questions, then absolutely, we can take advantage of that. I agree with you. We'd be remiss if we didn't look at that and follow it as those questions are answered. The thing is, everybody's kind of on the same, uh, position right now and some folks are starting to push ahead right and start to lead the pack and and those that lead the pack will will 
will uh, overcome some of those hardships that that we can't see how to overcome right now. That it's just it's just time and effort and development and pilots and all those things, right? And as they answer those, then we'll be we'll be following close behind. Right, thank you. We're we're really glad to see GRU uh, at this table here. This was one of the things I, I know that Megan and we worked really hard to because uh, we can't we can't get there without GRU. We we came up with that conclusion, and many of our members uh, was very maybe disappointed that GRU wasn't at the table as much as we thought they should be. But so I'm, I'm we're very encouraged. Well, we're, we're trying to partner with groups like you and other other groups in the community, um, other other committees and subcommittees, um, not only to lend our our input and our help, but also that to listen to hear to hear the things that are that are coming out of the community to to see how we can help in that and collaborate with those different groups to reach that goal. There, there's sometimes a stigma that GRU is resistive to renewable energy and, and that kind of thing, and, and that's absolutely not true. Um, it's just there, there's a lot of regulatory things that constrain us right now. Um, and as those regulations get updated and some of those uh, areas, we get a little more wiggle room, then we can, we can do that. And we're, we're happy to move forward. Um, but there's just some areas that, that regulations say, hey, you have to do this. And the existing technologies is a, is a, is a real barrier for us to have to meet that right now. So as it develops, absolutely, some of those things will will clear up and work themselves out. Um, and groups like this and working with groups will be important to, to reaching that goal. Thank you, Eric. That was definitely not a, a round of softballs. <laughs> I do appreciate, I appreciate the level of detail and really just talking through some of the, con the logic, right? The constraints and and understanding the system. I think everybody on this committee um, comes at, from a background that wants to understand those details, and we want to understand how the system works, so that we can partner with GRU, with the city and the county, to come up with um, options that are both meaningful in terms of their impact, but also realistic as something that we can do that's going to benefit the community and that is within the you know, operates within the realistic constraints that we find ourselves. Uh, so understanding how it works is very helpful. And, and I, I'm happy to, to bring information to the group. I've done a number of presentations for the UAB and city commission on, on how our electric grid works, how the regulations are in place. Um, all of the UAB members and city commission members tour one of theirs. I'm responsible for system control. Um, and they walk into the room and they see all of the things that these guys are watching and the regulations that they have to follow. Um, so I, I am an advocate, uh, not only for my folks for understanding, but also trying to bridge that gap because we realize there's a lot of folks in the community that want to help and want to join us and they may just may not know, know how, right? So I'll be happy to bring some of that information to this group and either do a presentation or what have you and, and allow you to ask questions on how does the grid work and what are some of those regulations that are, that are there um, and, and some of the constraints and, and we can definitely talk through that. Awesome, thank you. I, I'm sorry, Megan, to cut you off. I, I have one more question. For no, go for it. Um, go for it. <laughs> so has, are you aware has GRU either contracted out or internally done a comprehensive analysis of rate structure scenarios and equity impacts? Um, and I ask this because, you know, the economic, that third pillar of the school and the equity people pillar. Um, I don't, I don't want to forget about economics and the rate structures as another tool in the toolbox um, that can help move the technology further faster in an equitable way. So I guess in short, my question is, has anybody looked closely at, you know, these innovative progressive rate structures and how the benefits are distributed among the public? Sure. So uh, short answer is not tying all those things together, right? And a little bit more detail behind that is our rate structure 
um, is basically broken up into to two classes. You've got your commercial and you've got your residential and there are some wholesale customers and that, but they're a smaller percentage, right? And the idea is that no residential customer can subsidize the cost of another residential sub customer. Um, it has to be kind of across the board. And I, I use the term equitable, but that's, that's how it's, it's talked about within the utility industry as well. Um, and so there are some opportunities um, as new, we have AMI or automated metering infrastructure rolling out. As that technology rolls out and gets installed into the community, it does open up uh, some room for algorithms to be, de to be developed for, um, for different rate structures. Um, it opens up the opportunity to do time of use rates. It opens up the opportunity to be able to um, do pay as you go uh, for, for customers that wanna do that. Um, and so there are options that are out there, um, again, waiting on the, that technology to be deployed. Um, I think a big thing too is, is information. Um, the way that we have information now, um, it's basically a touch point with every customer once a month, right? You get one data point a month. Uh, with AMI and this new structure, you'll get a data point every 15 minutes and the customer will have access to that. And they can do real-time analysis on what's causing higher energy rates, right? They'll get real-time real feedback on changes that they make in their home uh, to help lower their rates and know if it's being effective or not. So part of that community outreach that you guys have discussed is also education and, and information on what is available. Um, how can you impact those things? Um, and, and what are the benefits of some of these other rate structures that are there? So, um, so again, uh, tying all those together, um, there's opportunities down the road with this new technological interface with AMI and giving customers access to all of that data. Um, but then there's going to be an education component that goes with that as well. So, um, we've talked about it. We've discussed those things, what kind of options there are for us to do it. Um, there are other utilities that have rolled out similar things, so we wouldn't be really reinventing the wheel. Um, it's just an, a rolled out of the technology and, and how do we educate folks on what they're capable of doing and seeing now with that new information um, and also implementing those structures. Thank you. I'm done with my questions, and I can I defer back to you. <laughs> no, I, I, I mean, I understand. I totally get it. So it's really nice to have sure. such an someone here who's as informed as you are and is willing to have these conversations with us. So we have not always had that, and I think that there may be some like bottled up questions that you know, just come your way. Uh, one thing and that's fine. Say is a, a lot of these questions in this conversation same conversation that, as you know, Eric, uh, that we're having in the empowerment program. And one of the things that we've been asking for it is for a rate that uh, that um, will allow people that pay a larger amount of their income toward power, uh, a rate that will um, allow them to reduce that amount. But uh, that's going to require a policy change. As, as you mentioned, right now, one residential customer can't uh, subsidize another residential customer. Right, and, and I think, you know, short of a policy change, um, some of those right structures, um, you know, you can help with that. Um, can you completely alleviate it? No. Um, there's there's a misconception, or, or at least I found there's a misconception that you know low income or disadvantaged means low power use or low consumption, and those two are are definitely not correlated at all. Some of it has to do with housing stock. Some of it has to do with um, knowledge and information of of what's using power in their home. So there's a number of things that that go into that answer, right? Um, but even without a policy change and the, the requirement to not subsidize another customer, giving customers information and how they use their energy uh, can only be beneficial in helping them understand how much energy they use and how to reduce that. 
Right now, the lever we have to pull on reducing bill is a reduction in volume and use. Well, how do we do that? Some of the people are working on community weatherization, the, the CWC, that's you know updating housing stock and doing insulation and replacing windows and doing energy audits. Um, GRU is coming with the AMI and being able to give customers information on how they use energy and how to possibly reduce that use. And so I think the combination of those things um, is going to have a large impact even without the, the policy changes. But, but you're right. If we want to go to that level, that is going to require a policy change. Um, and that's above my pay grade, at least. So. Well, and um, this is a comment, not a question, but water is such a critical part of that overall equation that we often forget about. Um, and I think, uh, I, I hope our committee and GRU can also think about, you know, how those benefits and not subsidizing other customers, how the water ties into that as well with reclaimed water and new development you know, that are out west or, you know, new development that you could pay to put that purple pipe in. And how is that affecting the users? Like so many of the low-income families, our neighbors who have such high energy burdens use the least amount of water. I mean, they use what's necessary. And I feel like I haven't done the economic analysis myself in detail, <laughs> but isn't that, I, I mean, I, I kind of, I want to learn more about the water equity question and how, because in my mind, it's almost like the low in, lower income customers are subsidizing the wealthier to be able to you know, irrigate, you know, irrigate their lawn. And that just doesn't um, but uh, anyway, but the comments really focused on the nexus between the energy and the water, and with the municipal DRU being in a position to affect not just energy but also the water and the cost burden um, is part of the so, operation as well. So I believe that's a great, great comment. Um, and and the way I'll I'll respond to that, and not that I'm I'm you know countering, um, but my background is in the power realm, and I am learning the water realm, right, and and coming up to speed on that. Um, and so you know, as we learn that, or as I learn that, then then there'll be an investigation on how do we how do we do that. The way the utility is set up right now is each system is independent financially, um, you know, structurally, all those things have to be run as individual businesses. So in that case, you know, we're talking of subsidizing, there's, there, we can't subsidize the utility even across utilities, they have to be, have to remain separate. Um, and so, you know, with that, there are some questions about reclaim water and, and potable water and and reuse and and all of those things so um yeah definitely entertain a, a discussion on that once i get once i get some more tools in my tool belt to talk about it thank you i'll stop now <laughs> i mean that might be it sounds like the next month's agenda is pretty full but i mean there, there could could be a valuable item in a couple of months to just be able to have more of a Q&A that evolves into a discussion and it delves into some of these things. Because I think, you know, this committee, it's science-based, right? Like we, the targets that we're setting are based on the science and those targets are scarily ambitious. Like what we actually need to do is frighteningly ambitious. And so I think the committee also, we are, are setting ambitious goals, but the only way that you can actually have a meaningful impact is if your proposals are also realistic you know it has to be doable and so in order to to make that happen we have to understand how the system works and we have to understand where the barriers are and if they're structural barriers to in the system are those things that we can change can we actually change the system is that the best path forward or do we have to find a way around and so these sorts of discussions like we're having now we're, we're, we're identifying 
how the system works and we're talking about how we can work with it or how we might even be able to change it are really, really crucial. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'll, leave it, I'll leave it to you all, whether you wanna have that conversation, but that might be um, a useful item where it's just a little bit free flowing um, as, you know, ask a question, get an answer, brings up another question and go from there. It's very important to understand the current situation so that we we can know what what's viable. Um, it, it's also important to understand what the profile of the GRU power grid is. Uh, it, it, it's kind of really different as I as I studied it uh, compared to uh, other cities. Uh, it, it's different. It's it, it's a very commercial driven uh, profile and and it, it it doesn't have that industrial profile to it that doesn't lend itself to doing certain things so uh, i think it's very important to understand the the profile of the grid here and, and also the current profile of the fuel uh, that they have here to understand how we can integrate solar so uh, I, your your suggestion of bringing someone in to talk about that and what that current situation is. We, we had that at one time, uh, Megan, I think the GRU came in and, and, and did a discussion. It might be good for the newer members to, to, have, to see that kind of presentation again. Yeah, I agree, John. And not to pick on GRU, I think that could also be useful to maybe bring in um, someone from the city and from the county to talk about just kind of an overview of what what they're working on and what the you know what the levers are you know what what in the system has been identified as as blocks potentially to to climate action and then um, you know what what's currently being done and you know because I don't think I, we can't do this without GRU I mean John. May, I couldn't have said it better, um, but we also can't do it without the city and the county. And so I think that one thing also that the committee um, we try to do is not not like jump on GRU. We realize that you have you all have a really tough job, and it's something that we all depend on literally every single moment of every single day. Um, so it needs to be collaborative amongst all three jurisdictions. All right. Thank you. <laughs> I think we're finally Thank moving you. on. <laughs> um, so meet, next is meeting recap and action items. Um, I don't know that we need a recap necessarily because it's a fairly short agenda, but um, in terms of action items, Steve, did you have any written down? I think one of them was going through the old agendas and picking out accomplishments for the report. Were there any other action items? Yeah, I was going to basically do that and bring back an updated um, accomplishment list for an update for the annual report. So that'll be something I'll send out. Um, I'll send out a press release on the vacancies if you all want to spread that around and if you know people that might be interested. Um, and I will also send out an email to all the the members to see, make sure you're available for September 19th. And I apologize, I think the agenda has the date wrong on the uh, next meeting date. So, I'll set, so I got, I think I've got three after nine. All right, any, um, did we miss anything or for the committee? Did anyone catch anything that we missed on that? Nope. All right. Sounds good to go. Thank you, Steve. Yep. All right. Last up is public comment for our wonderful and loyal members of the public. I see Brian and Ellen. If either of you would like to comment, please um, raise your hand and Steve can promote you to a speaking role. We also have Kali Blunt in the audience as well in person. If, if oh. Nice. So you can want you come up so we they can hear you. I think it's coming out of here. So anywhere out here. Yeah. 
No, probably if you sat there, yeah, you would use, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm glad to hear the new person from GRU uh, talk about a vision to move toward uh, sustainable renewables. But I know it's, uh, oh, it's a heavy lift. How do you get the uh, GRU and the city commission who are hopelessly indentured to the bond rating regime to move toward thinking about uh, much grander scale, which is a human being, you know, we're on this 8,000 mile rock, and we depend on this thin smear of gases and liquids on its surface. And the real big deal is the sun in orbit and the miniature sun at its core. And we exist in the equation between them, and we can't change it. We can either continue to exist like parasites. And its natural cycles will get rid of us with hurricanes, earthquakes, eruptions, storms, fires, etc. Or we can learn to live like symbiotes. And that's what we're stuck with unless we become an interstellar species. We have to uh, somehow turn this grounded, short sighted, financially tethered thinking toward how do we exist as a species. Uh, harmony with the environment we depend on. Uh, and, and you can see how they're stuck uh, in just the fact that uh, no one can be allowed to go totally solar without the grid. Why should that be forbidden? That should be that should be gold. That should be cheered. Cheered at in the direction. So uh, I wish you all luck. This can't happen at just a local level. It has to be at least state level. And that's not going to happen without tremendous, and I'm everywhere. That's not going to happen without tremendous federal incentives, which are beginning, just beginning to come with this bill that's trying to pass now, but it's going to take a lot more. So uh, we are all trying to do a really heavy lift, trying to get that turned around. And, and once you get to state level, it is not just solar and geothermal, then you've got wind and wave. But we got to all think together as a larger unit than just the Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I see one, uh, whose hand is that? Ellen. I see Ellen has her hand raised on Zoom. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I've done muted. A um, couple of things. Uh, just want to, as a community member, thank Megan for being a, really a great role model for leading a very, very, very tough job. Not that the people in the gallery boxes are tough. You all are great. But the job of CCAC has been quite challenging. And I've just enjoyed watching your brain work and your graciousness work. Uh, anyway, I want to be more like you when I grow up. Um, <laughs> I do want the CCAC members, and especially Eric, nice to meet you. I'm a fly on the wall each meeting, and I take notes to share with the League of Women Voters Natural Resources Committee. They wanted to have liaisons to the different, um, like we have one on the UA, um, UAB, and I'm the liaison sort of for this. Uh, We've got at the League um, a list of community organizations. I stuck it in the chat. Um, and also, there's a group you haven't heard of yet, but you will, and it's called Let's Talk Climate, and it's a very, very loose coalition of environmentally concerned citizens and organizations, and it was born after the June 15th Sea Level Rise program, where we brought Dr. Harold Wanless up from Miami um, to talk about the impact on Gainesville of climate migration. And of course, to understand the migration, you had to understand heat and melting ice caps and what's going to happen. So uh, this group is also a network that would be very eager to, to, to work with CCAC. And just as one of your flies on the wall, I like the idea that you discussed about appointing one person who takes it on as their portfolio 
to be the liaison person to the community. And I'd be happy to connect um, those. Uh, to the point of a climate summit, this Let's Talk Climate is having two programs this week, and it would be, uh, in Hebrew, we have the word kavod. It kind of means glory. It would be so amazing to have a CCAC member or two or staffer or two attend either event. One is Cypress and Grove on Wednesday night, seven to nine. Trish Riley, who's, who runs Cinema Verde, green, green movies, is showing a few environmental shorts. And she's having every candidate that's willing to come talk only about their environmental concerns for Gainesville and Alachua County. So that should be fun at Cypress and Grove. You can have a beer, you can mingle. Uh, so that's seven to nine this Wednesday. The other event is uh, an En-ROADS simulation. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with En-ROADS. It's an MIT climate interactive, extraordinarily robust program with 18 levers you can pull. You can't see me, 18 levers. Um, uh, I'm, I'm waving my hand in the air. <laughs> uh, there's, we can cool the planet below two degrees centigrade. If we don't do anything at all, the planet by 2100 is en route to 3.6 degrees centigrade. The simulation game puts everybody in a group at the United Nations, simulated of course, and that will be Sunday from 11 to 2. It is free. You have to bring your own lunch. We'll have desserts, drinks, and fruit. And you'll be assigned randomly to a group, either a global leader, uh, a climate hawk, uh, the kind of people like me that you cross the street when you see me coming and you don't invite me to dinner parties anymore. Uh, the uh, We call them conventional energy producers. We don't call them bad guys, we call them conventional energy producers, business and industry, land use and agriculture. And you actually figure out how to be a global solution to the climate problem. So um, let's see, I can't post anything. I guess I could put my, my email in chat. If you're interested in coming, um, I did send Stephen and Amanda the flyer, um, but I don't know if that made it out. But here's who I am, and if you want to come, let me know, because we would absolutely love, love, love to have the glory of people here in Gainesville on the forefront of climate action come and work with the citizens who are coming. Thank you, Megan, for the, the chance to, to talk. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you for your kind words, and thank you for, for always being here to participate and offer resources and your thoughts. If you, so Ellen's um, comments are going, by the way, to Q&A for folks who may be looking. It's not actually going into the chat, it's going into Q&A, but we do have those captured. And then Ellen, if you want to send the two events to Stephen. Done. Um, yeah. Done. Okay, awesome, good, because he, he can forward the documentation out to us for folks who weren't able to write things down. That'd be great, thank you. All right, thank you. Yeah, Ellen, you, you sent that uh, this, this afternoon, correct? Yes, actually about oh. 5 30, so I'm not surprised. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'll send that out to everyone um, in the morning. Yeah. All right, thanks, Stephen. Um, that brings us to the end of our agenda. Um, are there any final final thoughts from anyone on the committee? Nope. All right, well, Stephen, I, what is the next meeting? I, I just want to, uh, Megan, to Say it, 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 it was really a pleasure working with you, and, and I want to thank you for all your work, uh, your your individual effort as well as your work with the group. You've been tremendous, and and you you led us well. Thank you so much. No, oh, thank you, John. It has been the honor and the pleasure has absolutely been mine. And I'm I'm not going to be on the committee anymore, but I'm definitely not going anywhere. So you all will still see me around. All right, and with that, um, we will call this meeting of the CCAC adjourned. Next meeting is September, what did you say, 19th, Stephen? Yeah, 19th. September 19th. Thank you all, have a good night. <laughs>